Okay, so third mini lecture for this period of October, uh, it was November 16th to 20th, so the week after Reading Week. Um, third mini lecture is, uh, uh, so let me just take you back here. So we ended off with this thinking about uh, property and the economics of innovation. Uh, now I want to, so, and, and, and uh, kind of capping off a discussion about the technical basis for uh, development of new innovation and its use in the areas of, of herbicides, insecticides, and uh, plant breeding in particular. And here we're going to see how they some of these things kind of come together and, and real controversies about these. Uh, and so the, we're going to use the case of glyphosate uh, and other herbicide resistance crops in uh, North America. So I, I, I talked about um, the discovery of glyphosate by the Monsanto company. Uh, here sh uh, is a graph which shows from 1992 to 2014, the amount of um, glyphosate which was used. And you basically see a, a linear uh, upward trend in the amount used um, uh, you know, to today, to 2014, but beyond till today. As uh, the use of glyphosate has risen, especially since, so the, the Monsanto um, uh, patent came off in the year 2000. Since then, other uh, companies are also producing. We can see the red line there shows the price, uh, and you can see how Monsanto was maintaining a quite a high price up until the year 2000, and then brought the price down, uh, and that price uh, has remained lower and generally gone lower through more competition with other companies. So you can imagine in a way uh, the, how Mon the profits that Monsanto made during those early years when they had the, the patent. But uh, you know it's interesting that most of the use of glyphosate has actually been since the patent has come off, although we still mostly uh, associate glyphosate with the Monsanto company. One of the challenges that develops when you have uh, reliance on a single type of insecticide uh, is, or, or other chemical is that as um, plants uh, adapt and mutate to the environment, an environment in which we have um, glyphosate being used, uh, then that could become less effective over, over time. This shows a graph of the number of uh, resistant weeds uh, that have developed over time, relatively small compared to the use of glyphosate. So yes, there has been some uh, development of, of resistance among the target weed populations, but perhaps less than had been expected. And really any new chemical will have this. So this really is, it's a disadvantage of any reliance on any chemical, not necessarily a particular unique feature of glyphosate. Here's a, a sort of a, you know, a key issue about glyphosate is how the Monsanto company kind of brought together different technologies. So we have on the right side, this is a, you know, Roundup or glyphosate, which is used to kill weeds. Uh, on the left side, you can see uh, the symbol for Roundup Ready. So this is Roundup Ready crops have been developed by plant breeding uh, and have been uh, to and through uh, transgenics to be resistant to glyphosate. So it means if you plant a crop, it's resistant to glyphosate, even when it's growing and all the weeds are growing, you can spray the glyphosate on top. The crop will remain because it is uh, resistant to the glyphosate. All the other weeds will die, right? So it's a very, very, effective way at controlling the agricultural environment uh, that allows you to kind of pack things in in time and space, right? So by combining glyphosate with a glyphosate resistant crops, uh, you really are kind of, kind of do a double effect on, on your weeds. Monsanto, uh, so they had all, lots of incentive to develop that, uh, that glyphosate resistant crop. They developed it in 1996, uh, it was quickly, as I said, as I show here by the year 2005, covered most uh, soybean fields, for example, in, in the United States. So 
uh, people reacted very, very quickly to um, glyphosate resistant crops um, and, 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 it, and it took over. So that uh, kind of solidified uh, Monsanto's claim to this space of, of glyphosate and glyphosate resistant crops having the, the, the patents on both of these. Um, it meant more glyphosate could be used for weed control. So that we sort of expanded the uh, demand for glyphosate uh, and meant that you could have higher yields through less competition with weeds, less need for tillage, uh, really quite a game changer in uh, agricultural operations. We call that HR, so herbicide resistant, and, but the main herbicide that, uh, that has um, been, that resistance has been developed for is for glyphosate. Another class of transgenic crops is insect resistant crops. So uh, this uses a um, bacterium called, called this described there, <laughs> Bacillus thuringiensis, uh, or BT. So I'll just use BT from now on. So the bacterium BT produces a toxin um, naturally. Uh, and there have been attempts to try to use that toxin as a biological, what we call a biological control. So basically a natural uh, control for insects. Um, and in 1996, um, scientists developed, um, developed a, a transgenetic genetic approach to insert this Bt gene from the, uh, the Bt um, bacterium into crops. Uh, the result is that there's less uh, insect damage to crops, which is, which is good. So the crop is growing. It's naturally resistant to the insect. The insect does less damage to it. Um, it also reduces the use of other things that would, you would use to uh, get rid of insects. So as I said, we just developed all of these over 100 different compounds to try to kill insects uh, in the periods of the 1940s to 1960s, uh, including uh, DTT, which had all these harmful effects. So developing something that where you could actually build the resistant to the insect right into the plant is, is a great advantage. So these are the two big ones. The two big transgenic crops which have been adopted at large, large, large scale are herbicide resistant varieties uh, and insect resistant varieties. There's a few other uh, things uh, other than Bt. There's also uh, there's something called the rainbow papaya that was developed at, by scientists at Cornell University for uh, for this context in Hawaii. Um, and that is that this, this variety of transgenic papaya is resistant to uh, a virus that was wiping out at that time, was wiping out the papaya crop of Hawaii. So um, we've got other examples of insect resistant crops, but, but, the, but the scale uh, at which they're adopted is much different. Okay. So this shows uh, the, ex, uh, the adoption of the BT, so uh, the uh, insect resistant uh, corn and cotton uh, and um, the herbicide resistant varieties of, of corn, cotton and soybeans. You can see how we went from, you know, like 10% adoption in 1996 to up over 80% adoption in all of these crops. Uh, by 2016. So these are really taken over in the United States um, and Canada to a little bit less extent, uh, less so in, in other parts of the world. And we'll talk about that in, in a while, but certainly uh, in, in Canada, US, we can see here also that has been more recently adopted in Brazil. And so now Brazil is the biggest user in terms of the percentage of, of arable land, which is planted with GM crops. So this is genetically modified crops. And as I said, that's mostly herbicide resistant and insect resistant crops. Brazil now has more greater percentage of the area planted to those crops than the US. Um, China and India are, are much lower as is the European Union. So only about 12 to 15% of the world crops uh, is uh, planted with is GM. Okay, so the, what's the, so the debate? Uh, so this is something large, large scale um, uh, in, in the US particularly. If, you know, they, for, let's focus on glyphosate. Um, 
kills a variety of weed sources, and including perennial weeds, which are hard to get rid of. It, it is applied directly to growing plant tissue, um, inhibiting the growth of a weed as it's growing. You don't you don't have to work have it work in the soil, so it's it's, it's applied to the growing crop, the growing plant. Uh, therefore, there's less res residue of it in the soil. It doesn't cause much, if any, harm to non-target plants and animals, as long as it's carefully applied. Um, glyphosate is also used here in Canada as a desiccant or um, something which reduces um, uh, water content uh, in the fall so that uh, canola can be harvested sooner. So lots of advantages. Disadvantages. Uh, include health effects, and I'll talk about that in, in more detail in the next lecture. That was a big focus in the next lecture, next mini lecture. Um, you have to take care when you're applying it to make sure that it does that it really goes on the plant that you want it to be to impact, but not other plants. Um, you have to. There has been some resistance developed, as I said, although perhaps not any more than any other um, chemical. It's expensive. People spend a lot of money on glyphosate. The question is how expensive, and that is sort of the issue of the counterfactual. Um, and then the other point that people see as a disadvantage is, is having Monsanto be kind of the developer and holder and seller of glyphosate and glyphosate resistance crops gives them this big sway over our agriculture. And people have come to see Monsanto as sort of the example of the kind of big, um, uh, big profit-driven agriculture enterprise, which does not care very much about the human or the environmental effects of its technologies, as long as it kind of can kind of dominate and, and, and make money. So if we're thinking about, so is glyphosate good or not? Uh, what the, at least for the United States, it would be hard for us to know what the world would be without it. Uh, so, but we, we, we would be challenged to think about what's the counterfactual. For example, would other herbicides be used if this wasn't being used? And if they were, which is almost certainly, would they be, be better or worse? They mostly would be worse. Uh, would farmers, uh, what else would farmers be doing to control weeds? So they used to have to use uh, cultivation and tillage to control weeds, so would they return to that? If they return to more tillage, uh, probably have greater greenhouse gas emissions because they would use more energy. Uh, tillage also damages soil organic matter. And we've talked about the importance of soil carbon. Uh, and they may well have to be farming larger areas for the same output. Uh, so that's thinking about this, the kind of Borlaug hypothesis here. Um, so this is something we'll, we'll get into in a minute, but this here I wanted to kind of establish this kind of debate and, and the, the issue of the counterfactual. So I'm gonna stop this mini lecture here. I'm gonna try.